Hello Physics, welcome to another flipped lecture. We are talking today about uh, the second half of chapter 19 on capacitance, um, capacitors and uh, modern end and earlier, and then how to store electric charge in general. So that's the topic of the day, 19B. As always, if you have any questions, you can feel free to post them in the comment section of the video here or um, on, the, uh, on the Schoology page or I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, but love to help you with any questions that arise. Here we go, capacitance and storing charge. The original design for something that uh, would contain electricity for a given amount of time was a Leiden jar, named after a town in Holland where one of the two physicists who developed this device lived um, in Leiden, Holland. It was also developed by an English chap at the same time, but um, the Leiden jar, well, the name there stuck. So. Uh, we, the basic idea is an insulating jar, something that will not transmit electricity through its own material. Originally it was glass. You can make these out of plastic. Um, you can make them out of any insulating material. And then you have to wrap the outside of it and the inside of it in some kind of conductive material. So initially molten lead was poured into a glass jar and the glass jar was run around so that the lead dried in a sheet on the inside of the glass jar and then they would dip the jar in more lead so that there was a lead layer on the outside and a lead layer on the inside and the two lead layers couldn't touch each other because of the insulating layer of glass. Um, and then they would take a rubber stopper and a metal rod and a bit of chain and create this contraption where electricity could be stored inside and gotten to through the metal rod and the chain. Um, and then the electricity would, uh, the electrons would build up inside there. And then the glass wall uh, kept the electrons building up inside the jar from being able to skip to the outside layer and run to the ground and then lose your charge. But um, the electrons in the lead lining outside the glass jar were uh, made uncomfortable by the great presence of electrons inside the jar. So they could escape to the ground. They could go to ground, and they would. They'd run away. And then if you lift the Leiden jar off of its grounding source and isolate it, now you have a region of positive charge in the lining on the outside and a region of negative charge in the lining on the inside. So you have a separation of charge, and the electrons could not jump across to complete that arc and balance the charge, and so you had stored charge, and that was the earliest battery-esque sort of thing that uh, people had come up with a uh, design for how to make. Um, and initially, a Leiden jar, you know, it, it, would, it would eventually lose charge because the electrons would, uh, would be able to escape out the, the jar, you know, various other ways, um, losing it through diffusion into the air and things of that nature. But um, they would hold charge for a while, and depending on how big these things are, and uh, and how well they're made, you can get a, a very large amount of charge stored in a Leiden jar, but only for a short amount of time. Um, so that's the that's the concept of a Leiden jar. Uh, modest amounts of electricity, actually, if you get a big one, a lot of electricity, uh, but only for a short amount of time, and then um, the charge would dissipate. So not good for the way we use batteries today, but uh, but it was a, a good way of getting charge stored as a first shot. Modern designs are the capacitor. Capacitor is the same kind of idea. Here we have a conductive surface and another conductive surface and the leads going out from it, right, on connecting to each conductive surface, and then a separating material that is an insulator. Fancy word for that is a dielectric, something that will not conduct charge. Same concept as the Leiden jar. Put a bunch of electrons here don't let them go here. The electrons here get uncomfortable and leave. And now you have positive region, negative region separated by a, an insulating material. And then if you allow these to bridge by completing a circuit around them, the electrons will jump over and you can do something with that movement of charge. Um, this is frequently rolled into a barrel shape. Most of the time capacitors are not flat like this. It's just diagrammatically easier to see them this way. But we take this, put another layer of insulator on top, and roll it into like a, a cinnamon roll sort of design, and that's the modern capacitor. 
when we bridge these two plates, we allow the charge to flow. So, and again, capacitors don't, start, don't store charge for a long time. Um, they will eventually bleed out, but the uh, this electricity can be stored there for uh, you know, a modest amount of time. Um, a day or two probably would be about the longest you think that you could hold some charge in a capacitor or a Leiden jar sort of design. Uh, but you can put a lot of electricity in what some of these modern capacitors. Um, here's just some pictures of them. Capacitors come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, and this is, this is a diagram of the modern design where in an old capacitor, it's just the two sheets. So here's some that are just two sheets separated by a dielectric. Here's one that's been rolled into a barrel. So you have uh, two dielectrics, usually paper, separated by two con conductors, again, some kind of foil most of the time. And then one uh, electrode goes down to one of these conductors and one electrode goes down to the other conductor. And then the paper separates them and you can store the charge that way, okay? Whoa, that was really fast. Let me not do that to you again. Sorry, if you just got seasick. Here we go. The strength of the dielectric between the two plates controls how much charge a capacitor can hold. If the dielectric can keep charge separated with a certain amount of strength, uh, eventually you put enough charge on these things and the charges will burn through the dielectric and bridge the gap and the capacitor explodes. And as my grandfather used to say, if you let the smoke out of a capacitor, it stops working. Um, it's not the smoke, but that's what happens when you put too much charge potential on a capacitor and the dielectric fails. It explodes. It's kind of fun. Um, the best dielectric is, of course, a vacuum. Uh, that's the best thing to keep uh, two charged objects from being able to conduct charge. So vacuum capacitors are out there, and they do a very good job. Um, the, the strength of the capacitor's field is measured um, with regard to how good it is at separating charge versus a vacuum. So we have this, this term, um, the strength of the capacitance field, strength of the field of the capacitor. We use an E because it's a field strength, right, for the capacitor, is a comparison of the strength of a vacuum. This E naught would be the strength of the dielectric of a vacuum compared to the cost of the material being used in the capacitor, which we use K for. So this is the strength of what material I actually have, paper, plastic, glass, something like that. Compared to a vacuum gives me the relative field strength of my capacitor. And you will use this in uh, a bit of math, this chapter, okay? Um, capacitance is a term that we use to describe how much charge a capacitor can hold. And of course, the capacitance is a function of the strength of the dielectric. Um, and so we will we'll do a little bit more math with this, where C is the capacitance. And to get to the, the amount of charge that that capacitor can hold, we use a constant called the permittivity of free space, which is this number, 8.852 times 10 to the negative 12th coulombs squared per newton meter squared. That's an ugly unit. But all it does is cancel out the rest of this equation and give you a, a, a number that you can work with. Okay, so don't stress too much about c squared over nm squared. It will resolve itself. Okay, don't worry about that. The 8.852 times 10 to the negative 12th, that's a number that you should have on the top of your unit. Okay, that is the permittivity of free space. And this has to do with how easy it is for electrons to jump across a vacuum. So again, we use a very similar term, right? E sub zero, if it's a capital sub zero, that's the dielectric strength of the vacuum. So it looks very similar. E sub zero, epsilon sub zero. It's not the same thing though. This is a Greek letter, and the other one is an English letter or an Arabic letter. So be sure that you uh, you don't confuse the two. Okay. This is the uh, dielectric of a, of a vacuum. This is the permittivity of free space. Uh, we use K for the dielectric constant of the material being used. Same thing that we had before. K represents how good of a dielectric do I have in my capacitor. A is the area of the capacitor's plates in square meters. This is the area of overlap. And that will uh, be important when you see variable capacitors. Um, but it's the area of overlap, right, between the plates. 
and D is the distance of separation between the plates in meters. How far apart are they? Now, square meters and meters, um, most capac capacitors are not anywhere near a square meter, nor are they separated anywhere near a meter. So these will be decibel values. These are small numbers okay, that you'll be using. Capacitance is measured in a unit called farads. Uh, a farad is the unit of capacitance. And a farad is one coulomb of charge per volt of separation. That is a massive number. So you will not see a capacitor that has two, three, four, five uh, farads. Not going to see that. We will see measurements of microfarads, picofarads, nanofarads, very small pieces of a farad. Okay? Um, so let's look at an example here. A capacitor is built with two plates having 1.5 times 10 to the negative third square meters area plates. So this is 10 to the negative third. So that's 0 0.0015 square meters. Okay, small number. Separated by 1.00 times 10 to the negative fourth meters. This is separated by a tenth of a millimeter. All right, small numbers. By dielectric of waxed paper. So it's wax paper that's separating these two plates. What is the capacitance? Here's my formula again, just in case you forgot. First, we need to look up the value for K for waxed paper. You would do that in your book um, or online, and you would find that the capacitance, the, the value for K, the dielectric constant for waxed paper is 2.2, .2, and then that ugly unit, right? C squared, Nm squared. I just put two there, but those are squares. Um, so we plug that in. Here's my 2.2 for K. Oh, look at that. Not the units. It's a, it's a constant. No units for 2.2. Forget that last second. 2.2 is my uh, dielectric constant. Here's my permittivity of free space. There's my ugly unit. Sorry about that. Um, and then this is the area of the plates. 1.5 times 10 to the negative third square meters separated by my distance of separation, 1.00 times 10 to the negative fourth. Multiply all of this across, okay? Now notice what happens here. I have square meters up here. I have square meters in the denominator of this unit, so they're gonna go away, right? So I wind up with 2.92116 times 10 to the negative 14th. That's what 10 to the negative 12th and 10 to the negative third, and uh, then the rest of the multiplication here gives me this number. I'm not solving for significant digits yet. And squared, uh, columns squared per Newton. That's where I wind up with here. Now I do the division. 10 to the negative fourth divided by, sorry, 10 to the negative 14th divided by 10 to the negative fourth winds me at 10 to the negative 10th. Here's the division of my numbers. Here's my new unit, C squared over Newton meters. Well, a Newton meter is a joule. So C squared divided by joules. A joule is a volt per coulomb. So if I simplify this, it could be coulomb squared per uh, joule, I'm sorry, per volt per coulomb, uh, taking a coulomb out of the bottom and a coulomb out of the top, and I have coulombs per volt, and that's my unit for a farad. So you don't need to be able to do all of this unit conversion. Just know that when you do this math, this ugly unit and the meters and the square meters turn into farads. Okay, so that's that's handy. I just did this once to show you how it happens. So I wind up with 2.92116 times 10 to the negative 10th farads and uh, need to correct for significant digits. I have 2.2, .2, I have 1.5, I have 1.00. So I have two significant digits times 10 to the negative 10th farads. All right. Capacitors. Um, if you join capacitors into a circuit and you have more than one capacitor, which you would in any real circuit, right? In any real circuit, you have um, multiple capacitors and you have to figure out what, how many farads do all of these capacitors taken together represent. So there's two ways you can join things in a circuit. If they're resistors or if they're capacitors or if they're uh, coils or if they're diodes or whatever it is, if you combine multiple things into a circuit, then you, uh, you have the ability to do it in parallel or in series. The parallel uh, looks like this. 
where electricity flows across one side of all of the capacitors through all the capacitors at the same time and then out the other side of the capacitors and on to something else in the circuit. So the electricity can flow through any one of these capacitors and then get to the other side of them. That's parallel. The opposite is series where it has to go through one capacitor and then through another capacitor and then through another capacitor. We talked about this with regard to resistors as well. Resistors can be parallel or in series, okay? Capacitors joined in parallel on the circuit have a total capacitance of the sum of all individual capacitors. So this capacitance plus this one plus this one gives me the total capacitance for that circuit. That's pretty simple. Just add them up. If they're in series, it's a little bit harder. It's the inverse of the total capacitance is equal to the inverse of the sum of the capacitances. So 1 over the capacitance of the first capacitor plus 1 over the capacitance of the second plus 1 over the capacitance of the third or in however many other ones you have gives you 1 over the total capacitance. So you have to add up the inverses then take the inverse of your answer. The moral of the story is capacitors in parallel add capacitance. Capacitors in series actually subtract capacitance. The sum is always less than any one individual capacitor. Okay. So let's analyze this circuit together. Here we have a battery. Here we have two capacitors in, in series. Then this um, capacitor in parallel with these two means I get to figure out these first. Then I can add it to this one. And now this unit of capacitors together is in series with this one. So let's add this up one step at a time. First, we're going to analyze the series capacitors on this part of the circuit. One over the total is 1 over each one individually, right? So 40 micro uh, farads and 60 microfarads. 1 over 60 microfarads, 1 over 40 microfarads. That's 1 over 60 plus 1 over 40. Remember how to add fractions? You need a common denominator, right? What's the common denominator between a 60th and a 40th? 1 120th, right? So so 1 60th becomes 2 120th, 1 40th becomes 3 120th, 2 and 3 is 5 120th, and so 120, uh, divi sorry, 5 divided by 120 is the inverse of my answer. So to get to my answer, I'm going to take the inverse of both sides of this, and now I wind up with my answer is equal to 120 divided by 5. 120 divided by 5 is 24. So these two capacitors in series have a total of 24 microfarads. Notice this is 60 and this is 40. By putting them in series, I've reduced my capacitance. Okay, so that's 24. Now we're going to consider the two capacitors here in parallel. These two make 24, and it's in parallel with one that's 100. That's easy. Parallel, you get to add. 24 plus 100 is 124 microfarads. Perfect. That's super simple. Now I need to analyze the series of capacitors here. 124 in series with 20. 1 over the total, 1 over 124, 1 over 20. The uh, least common multiple of 20 and 124 is 620. So 500, 5 620ths plus 31 620ths is 36 620ths. That's the inverse of my answer the inverse of both sides. The total is 620 divided by 36. That's 17.222 microfarads. And now um, I, I need to just correct for significant digits, right? Um, and so 17.222 over here, I had one significant digit, one significant digit, one significant digit, and this one was one as well. So only one significant digit. Got to go to 20 microfarads as my answer. Okay, look through that again if you have any questions. Um, that is the second half of chapter 19, capacitors and Leiden jars in series and in parallel. If you have any questions, I'll see you tomorrow. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.